My name is Dane Scott. I'm the new director of the Center for Ethics. And our speaker today is Daniel Kimmis, who probably needs no introduction here in Missoula. I've listed up there three of the books that he's written in case you're interested after the talk. But I think to, to get on with it, here's Daniel Kimmis. Hold on. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to some good discussion here, and I consider my job to provoke the discussion and then get on with it. So I'm not going to talk for a great long while. Um, the overall topic of the series has to do with sustainability, and um, my talk in particular has to do with some relationship between issues of sustainability and scale. A couple of uh, foundational observations then. First of all, I take it that sustainability is itself an ethical consideration, that those of us who feel drawn to even think about sustainability do so because we feel an ethical mandate to uh, live in such a way that our descendants uh, have a, a, a world that they can well inhabit. And that seems to me to be a fundamentally ethical um, mandate that, uh, that I think most people who spend time thinking about sustainability uh, feel the, the, the force of that mandate. The second observation, I think, is a little bit less universally held. Um, and, and this, I take it, is, is um, essentially Aristotelian, in that, to my mind at least, it makes very little sense in most cases to concern ourselves about ethics if we are not simultaneously concerning ourselves about politics. Um, it, would be inconceivable that we could have had Aristotle's uh, corpus of, uh, of work if all he had written were his ethics. If he had not written his politics as well, he would not be Aristotle. And I would say that, uh, that whereas I think it's a very good thing that most universities now for example, think that in some way that ethics have to be part of the curriculum for any well-educated person. I would argue that the same should be true of politics, um, and that if we have not taught ourselves to think well about politics, that we're actually not likely to do very well with our ethics, at least in applying them to the real world. And that, I certainly believe, is the case when we're talking about an issue like sustainability. Because while there certainly are individual actions that, uh, that people can and should take that will lead to uh, fulfilling that ethical mandate of sustainability, the fact is that if all that we do is, say, is act as individuals, that it is almost a given that we will fail overall in our ethical mandate to pass on to our descendants a, de a sustained and sustainable world. What I want to talk about in particular then, and this is by no means meant to be an argument that, that scale is the end all and be all of the ethics or politics of, uh, of sustainability, it's only to argue that it is an important dimension of how we should think about it. And to open the conversation, um, I want to start with, uh, with the scale that I have been professionally engaged in with for, um, for essentially the last nine years. That is the scale of the Rocky Mountain West since leaving the mayor's office in 1996 and moving to the University of Montana's Center for the Rocky Mountain West in 
I've pretty much been a professional Westerner for, uh, for all of those years. And, and so I'm going to start with the, the, the perspective that I've picked up from, from my work um, at, at working at that scale. And I want to start with, um, with a writer that many of you have some familiarity with and, and several of you might not know at all. Um, and that's John Wesley Powell. Powell uh, was lived from um, essentially the, the, the uh, 1840s until um, early in the 20th century. He was a Civil War veteran, as his name gives away. He was raised in a Methodist family. Uh, he did, uh, he was a, a strong abolitionist. Um, as I say, he fought on the Union side. He lost an arm at the Battle of, uh, of Shiloh. Um, he had educated himself as a, as a scientist, and when the war was over, he went west, and um, he, did, he ended up <coughs> becoming one of America's great explorers. He, did, he explored, in particular, the, the Colorado Plateau. He led the first expedition, uh, the first raft expedition down the Green River and the, and the Colorado. And any of you who have, who have been on the Colorado can only imagine what it must have been like uh, taking those rafts down, never knowing what was around the next corner. And um, the, the, the account is a wonderful account of how after they had, had survived any given one of, the, of those rapids, that the one thing they were sure of was that it couldn't get any worse than that. <laughs> and, they, and then the next time, of course, it did. Well, what Powell is, is um, best remembered for, beyond his wonderful description of, the, of uh, the exploration of the geography and the ethnography uh, of, the, of the Colorado Plateau, was that he went on to become the head of the U.S. Geological Survey, um, and in that capacity, he made a series of recommendations about how the West should be settled. He, did, uh, he paid a lot of attention to the Indian tribes. He was very concerned about the Indian tribes that lived here. He knew that, uh, that European settlement was coming to the West, and so he made a series of recommendations to Congress about how the West should be settled. And while Powell did not use this word, I'm convinced that if he were writing now, that what he would, uh, he would have been arguing is, this is what you should do if you're going to settle the West in a sustainable way. And um, essentially what, uh, what he argued was that um, a, a couple of things. First of all, that um, you, if you're going to settle the West sustainably, you need to pay attention to the lay of the land and the way the water flows. And, it, and what he meant was, because this is arid country, if you're going to live sustainably here, you should draw your jurisdictional boundaries on the ridge line so that people within a, a watershed are operating together and trying to figure out um, how to do whatever needs to be done within that watershed. He said if you bring different watersheds together um, and, and try to get people um, on different sides of the ridge line to act as if they're all one people, you're just asking for trouble. So he said, the worst thing you can possibly do in the West is to draw straight lines on it. Well, just take a look at the Rocky Mountain West and look at the political jurisdictions, and you see how closely we paid attention to that piece of, uh, of advice. Um, the other thing that, uh, that he said is that, <coughs> that um, even at the scale of, uh, of individual homesteads, that those also should be shaped to the, way, to the lay of the land. Um, he was operating at the time that the, that, uh, the later editions of the Homestead Act were, were being adopted. And he argued that whereas 
160 acres, 320 acres, might have worked east of the 100th meridian. That when you got into the arid west, if you tried to populate it by drawing straight line grids on section lines, regardless of where the water was, that you were asking for a human tragedy. And in fact, that's exactly what we got. And my family, in fact, is, a, is part of that, and, a, and some of yours may be as well. I grew up on one of those homesteads in, uh, in eastern Montana that proved to be too small and without any real access to water. And we have, uh, have seen a vast amount of, uh, of human tragedy simply because we did not pay attention to the way the water flows and the, and the lay of the land. Um, and we continue to see that. We continue to see the, the, the tremendously painful depopulation of the Great Plains and of, uh, of those rural communities in eastern Montana and the, and the rest of the Great Plains. And all of that human tragedy really can be brought back to simple misunderstanding of, uh, of what our public policy should be and, uh, and what our politics should be. Well, that, uh, that uh, just lays the groundwork a little bit for, the, to, for getting us to think about issues of sustainability in terms of how it relates to what I would call organic as opposed to artificial uh, political jurisdictions. What we have created are a lot of, of artificial political jurisdictions that have nothing to do with the lay of the land. And we have, in fact, made it harder to, to, to um, inhabit these landscapes well. But let me jump from, uh, from Powell, then, and from the West to the national scale and, uh, and just put another part of the picture in place. Shortly after uh, Powell's uh, work uh, was finished, um, another figure appeared on the scene whose work, again, some of you may know, um, I'm thinking of Herbert Crowley. Uh, Crowley was, uh, was part of, uh, of the progressive movement. He wrote a seminal book uh, called The Promise of American Life. And basically what Crowley argued in the early 20th century was that it was time for Americans to begin to act together as a nation in a way that, uh, that we had not done previously. Um, and his was a, a, a combination, I would say, of an ethical argument and a, and a political argument. Now, why did the argument even need to be made? Well, prior to the early 20th century, there were very few ways in which we in America had undertaken significant public projects at the national scale. Most of what we wanted to do, we did either locally or at the state scale. But part of what had given impetus to the progressive movement in the late 19th and early 20th century was the recognition that, uh, that there were economic forces now afoot on the landscape that had outgrown the capacity of localities or even of states to control them. Corporations in particular had, uh, had grown so large that, uh, that no locality and very few states could, uh, could uh, substantially control uh, those corporations. And so uh, you had uh, the era of the, uh, of the robber barons and all the rest of it. And, uh, and Montana's history, is uh, early history, is uh, replete with, uh, with the downside of, uh, of that kind of economic activity and the fact that we did not have political entities operating at the scale that, uh, that could con control that economic activity. So a lot of what was behind Crowley's argument and that of other progressives was that we needed to develop at the national scale a capacity to come together as a nation and form intentions as a nation, to form programs and a sense of direction as a nation and, it, and then to move together as a nation to, uh, to accomplish those things. It's hard for us now to quite, uh, to quite get in touch with, uh, with what a change that was, because all of us have grown up 
in a situation where it's taken for granted that, uh, that a lot of what we're going to try to do uh, of, a, of any significance, we're going to do as a nation. But in, in the early 20th century, that simply was not the case. And so, to, so Crowley's argument about, uh, about nationhood was very important. And one of the people who was most strongly influenced by, De, by Crowley was Theodore Roosevelt. So Roosevelt began running on a platform of what he called the new nationalism, um, and, and began to say that, uh, that it's precisely as Americans that, uh, that we need to set our direction and so on. And one of the places that that came most clearly into play, a place that would have huge significance, were the Rocky Mountain West that, uh, that Powell had talked about, had to do with public lands. Because the conservation <coughs> movement, which had grown up uh, in, uh, uh, essentially on the East Coast in the, in the uh, late 19th century, uh, was, uh, was not fundamentally a national movement until people like Crowley and Roosevelt and, and Gifford Pinchot got hold of it. And then, guided by Crowley's argument, <coughs> they said, if we're going to be serious about conservation, it's as a nation that we need to do it. And so we created this system of national public lands. We might have had public lands that were not at the national scale. And in fact, Powell had argued that if we were going to have public lands, that they should be at the watershed scale. Uh, but, uh, but that was not where we went. We went in this national direction. And for very good reason, there were a lot of good reasons. There was the economic reason and, uh, and many others as well. But what I do, all I want to do here is, is sort of draw this picture and, and enforce on our minds the extent then to which both the conservation movement and later even more so the environmental movement, which is sort of an outgrowth of the conservation movement, the extent to which those movements took nationalism as, their, as a fundamental premise. So when we got to the, the, the environmental movement in the 1960s and 1970s, it was practically a matter of, a, of unquestioned faith that most of, a, of the pieces of environmental legislation and so on, whether it's the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, or whatever it might be, that they would all be essentially national legislation. Not that there wasn't state legislation, not that there's not been local ordinances and so on, but the environmental movement early became, uh, to a very great extent, um, a, a, a national movement. And again, for good reason, because, uh, because many of the environmental problems that, uh, that we faced, many of the unsustainable practices that we had fallen into, it seemed as if they were beyond the reach of localities and beyond the reach of, uh, of states so that we had to act together as a, as a nation. For example, the, the Clean Water Act, there, there was a feeling that if you just leave it to states, they may be well-intentioned, but if you don't have a, 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 a series of regulations that apply across the country, then states will always be um, shaving off at the margins. In other words, they'll be trying to gain uh, competitive economic advantage by lowering their standards. And so you'll sort of have a race to the bottom. So this is a, has been a big part of, a, of the, the, the sort of nationalization of, a, of the environmental movement. And, the, and that goes on at, at all levels. And again, I, as I say, there have been good reasons for that. But history goes on. It never stands still. And so whatever may have seemed to be the way to do things at any given stage of history becomes dubious later on. And I would argue that we're now to the point where we at least need to start asking some hard questions about the national role in something like environmental protection as opposed to operating at, uh, at other scales. 
And so here I want to go back to what Powell was really getting at and how I think Powell would see, would see things today if he were writing after the environmental movement had come along. Because what is the environmental movement finally? What is it that, did, that gives force to the environmental movement? What I would argue, and this may be a little too mystical for most people, and that's fine, but what I would argue <laughs> is that, uh, that, the, that uh, the real force behind the environmental movement comes from the needs of the earth itself. It is the earth that, uh, that um, is hurting. It is the earth that, uh, that is in trouble. It is the earth that, uh, that um, is making its claims on us through the environmental movement. Now, obviously, there, there are many aspects of the environmental movement that are, that are plenty um, anthro anthropocentric. In other words, we're taking care of ourselves. There's no doubt about that. But there's more to it than that. In particular, deep ecology would always insist that there's more to it than that. But if the Earth is going to speak through us, how is it going to do that? Well, I think what Powell would say is it will do it through its own forms. In other words, the Earth speaks best when its particular landscapes, particular ecosystems, particular watersheds that are making these claims on us. And we'll hear those, uh, those mandates more clearly to the extent that we organize ourselves according to the lay of the land. And this is where that strange argument of Powell's, I think, gains tremendous cogency today. Because nobody could understand <coughs> why he was worried about watersheds and ecosystems. He didn't call them that. But I think the, the, the reason is simply that, uh, that we are, in fact, so closely, our human activity is so closely related <coughs> to where we are, and that if we're going to do well with our human activity in relation to the land, we really have to be paying attention to the landscape itself. <coughs> I get this that water? is your one. <laughs> That's the way that water flows. All right. I think one of the most interesting phenomena of the last few decades has been um, what, uh, now I'm going to give a, a, a uh, big uh, term here, but, uh, but you don't have to swallow this. I'm going to call it emergent organicism. Um, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is that in the last 30 years or so, at every scale that we can think of, that we see more and more human activity organizing itself around um, natural landforms and beginning to sort of draw away from the artificial boundaries that we put on the Earth. So let's start at the, bi at the biggest scale that, uh, that we operate at, and that's the global scale. We are, to, are accustomed now to, to, to saying that we live in a global economy. Well, in a sense, we always have, but, uh, but the economy has become global in a, in a way that it never was before. There are interrelationships at the global scale that have never existed before. The World Wide Web has to be a World Wide Web. There is no real way that the internet could operate and, and be what it is potentially, except at the global scale. Uh, we have gotten to the place where, to, where we, as inhabitants of the Earth, have the capacity to influence Earth systems, like uh, weather systems and, and climate and so on. And so we have to take responsibility. What I'm getting at is that, uh, that over a fairly short period of history, that, uh, that the organic Earth itself is claiming us and, uh, and forcing us to, uh, to organize ourselves at, uh, at that organic scale. Simultaneously with that, we see the emergence of continentalism in a serious way, and, and um, it'll It'll run into problems. Europe is obviously struggling now with what it means to be Europe. 
But anybody who thinks that, uh, that we've seen the end of, uh, of uh, European continentalism or continentalism anywhere else, I think is simply on the, uh, on the wrong track. So, to, so we see the organic uh, scale of the Earth. We see the organic scale of continents, where increasingly the artificial boundaries are, to, are becoming less relevant and the, the organic boundaries more relevant. And then at the subcontinental scale, you've got uh, things like places like the Rocky Mountain West, which is what our center deals with. Um, but it turns out that in the last 15 years or so, there is just a mushrooming of, a, of, a, of centers and institutes paying attention to the Rocky Mountain West. Why is that? What's that all about? Well, what I want to suggest, uh, um, at least uh, as, a, as a kind of impressionistic take on it, is that it's just one more scale at, uh, at which we're beginning to organize ourselves around these organic landforms. So now we in the Rocky Mountain West are talking about holding a presidential primary in 2008 that would include all eight states voting together uh, in, the, uh, in the primary so that we can have a voice in, in national politics. Well, that's just one example of how this organic emergence is, uh, is showing itself at the subcontinental scale. Then you have watersheds, you have ecosystems, um, the, the, the growth in, in the number of, uh, of watershed councils, um, especially across the West over the last 15 years is just phenomenal. At every scale, down to neighborhoods within cities, what you see is that the artificial boundaries are becoming less important, and these natural, organic um, entities are, to, are becoming more important. The non-organic forms obviously do remain important. There are certain things that, uh, that we rely on them to do, and I'm not arguing that they're, that they're likely to go away anytime soon, nor that we should uh, stop trying to operate at that scale. But two things I would say. First of all, those artificial <coughs> jurisdictions often don't match the issues that they try to deal with. Um, and it, it, um, an example of, of that <coughs> would be um, clean water issues, for example, or endangered species issues. Um, endangered species very rarely exist either across a whole nation or only within a nation. Uh, the, uh, um, the grizzlies, for example, uh, move up and down the spine of the continent. And if we're going to protect grizzlies, we have to do it um, at least internationally. Uh, but, uh, but I would argue that, uh, that to a certain extent, we need to do it regionally. And working at the wrong scale is costly in many ways. It's costly in that when you try to impose uh, regulations across a whole range of, uh, of different conditions, you end up, uh, first of all, creating a very large bureaucracy, almost without exception, that you then have to pay for, that ends up not fitting the circumstances that you're dealing with. So let me just close by giving a, a few examples of how it is that, uh, that I think we face some interesting political and ethical choices with regard to, <laughs> to some of these issues. I talked about endangered species. Right now, the, the, the Endangered Species Act is, uh, um, is being debated in Congress. A, a fairly far-reaching uh, change in the act has passed the House and is headed for the Senate, and there'll be some very strong debates about it, as there should be. Uh, there, there are some big issues about endangered species. What I would argue is that, uh, that uh, while I think it's a very good thing that we as a nation have decided to step in and, uh, and uh, protect biological diversity, that doing it at the national scale does in fact create some of those costs and, the, and those inefficiencies that I talked about, and that's why there is now a move to change the act because it doesn't work perfectly and it never can at the national scale. But let me just give an example of, uh, of where 
I think that, uh, that the artificial boundaries become a problem. We have now um, in, in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming gotten to the place where wolf recovery has been successful enough that, uh, that uh, the wolves are being delisted. And the way that they get delisted is that each state comes forward with a management plan about how they'll manage wolves. And then if their plan is good enough, then the federal government says, OK, then you can manage wolves. Well, who can possibly argue that it makes sense for Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming separately to come up with, a, with wolf recovery plans? The wolves are going to refuse to pay any attention to which state they're in. Right? Okay. And, uh, and so the, the, the only thing that it seems to me can make sense is some form of interstate compact among those three states that, by which we would agree on a, uh, on a regional wolf recovery plan. So there's a place where, to, where an issue, a very important issue of sustainability, I think is running up against uh, the, the, the political boundaries, and we, and we just need to rethink it. We need to rethink the scale at which we operate. Let me move for a minute outside of, uh, of uh, natural resource issues and talk about education. And here, I, I think we, do, we see a couple of, uh, of ways in which well-intentioned policies run up against these jurisdictional boundaries in really confounding ways. One is the well-intentioned policy that lies behind the No Child Left Behind Act. And as I understand that act, it's a, it grows out of a desire on our part as a nation in true Herbert Crowley fashion that we want to make sure that, uh, that all of our children are getting a sound and good education across this country. And so we, do, we come up with an app that, uh, that uh, puts in place a number of tests and, uh, and so on. And what do we find? Well, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work to, to, to try to do something like that at the national scale. And I would say there's no way it's going to work and, uh, and that, uh, that we should substantially lower our expectations about what we can do at the national scale. Well, let me bring that <clears throat> the education <clears throat> discussion down to Montana, because here too we have very well-intentioned policy written into our state constitution that says that, uh, that we want to provide equal quality education for all Montanans. Now, who can argue with that? That is obviously a very good idea. The fact of the matter is, though, that, uh, that every state that, uh, that has tried to enact something like that runs into a situation where particular localities find it next to impossible to invest in their educational system in order to make that educational system as good as it can be for that community. Now, you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, what we know is that in a place like Montana, that what drives economic prosperity increasingly in Montana is simply how well our communities do. A community that thrives as a community generates wealth in a way that nothing else in this state can generate wealth. Now, we as communities can invest in trails and park systems, we can invest in, in all kinds of things that make it a better community, but we have practically no capacity now to invest in quality education as a community because of the overall effort to have equal quality education across Montana. Now, to me, that's a political and ethical dilemma, and, and quite a serious one. Um, I'm all for the idea of, uh, of uh, um, equal education, of, uh, of high quality education. But because we know that educational systems are key to how well a community does, to say to our communities in effect that you can't make the best educational system for your community that you're capable of is basically a matter of cutting off our nose to spite our face, and it's going to hurt us overall. It's going to make Montana poorer uh, because of a, of a well-intentioned policy of, a, of statewide 
um, equality. And finally, I'm going to close with New Orleans. Um, I think the worst idea that I've heard for a long time is that the nation should build New Orleans. A nation can't build cities. And we can only do harm and will do a vast amount of harm to the extent that we take on the rebuilding of New Orleans as a, as a national um, task. Uh, we will waste huge amounts of money. Uh, we, do, we will enter into it in, in ways that cannot be sustained if we try to apply it to, uh, to other situations. And it's simply a case where, to, where good intentions exercised at the wrong scale I believe are, to, are asking for a lot of trouble. So um, now I hope that there's actually some good news in the middle of all that. I shouldn't end with, uh, with uh, such a sorry example. Uh, but again, my idea here was to provoke some discussion. So let's have at it. Well, I think some good news you might pull out of your, your last tidbit there is, you know, um, I think Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans has, for many people, prompted um, thought about uh, ecology at different scales and, uh, to use ecological language, disturbance, and uh, perhaps prompted an awareness that hasn't been there and is probably sorely needed for all of us in terms of, um, I think you suggest that a number of times, but just uh, intellectual humility, but also ecological humility in, uh, in having an awareness of our connections to land and to ecology and to nature. And it's kind of what Jared Diamond's gotten at in some of his uh, recent books. I think I'm a little confused or maybe want to open up the discussion about when you're talking about education as an example and maybe the inappropriate scale um, that we were looking at it, particularly the state, right. um, and then drop it down to communities and say if communities could focus on improving it, then you know that they've got a chance. What I wonder about that is if in America, for instance, if that up opens up the education system to get sucked into and battered by the capitalist society. So recognizing that you've got communities in eastern Montana, for instance, that are just barely hanging on, but they're still there. Um, you know, if, if we left it, if we did try that out, it just seems ultimately like they're doomed to fail. Um, and what's the ethic of that? Well, I mean, then, we're, then, you know, for instance, if we do inspire folks to then move into more prosperous communities, contribute to that community, um, what, we, what we're still doing is we're starting to still kind of conglomerate. Right. And, it, you know, I think you get to the nub of, a, of the ethical issue with that, and I don't pretend that, uh, that there's an easy answer to it. I guess what I, what I would like to see there is what I would think of as a as sort of a Rawlsian approach where, to, where uh, we, do, we would actually set a standard that, uh, that says every time that, uh, that a community ratchets itself up, that, uh, that part of, uh, of the extra revenue that it generates has to go into helping the least advantaged. Um, so, that, uh, so that you could sort of get the best of both worlds, so that, uh, so that communities that really want to aim for excellence are able to do it, but that they have to pay a, a kind of equality tax every time that, uh, that they do it. Um, so, to, so that's part of how I would hope that it might work out. Still, I don't mean to pretend that uh, that, that gets rid of, uh, of your concern. And, that, and the fact of the matter is, of course, that some of those eastern Montana communities are on their way to disappearing almost no matter what you do. And I think there's an ethical question of to what extent is it actually a good idea to prop up communities that, uh, that are destined to pass away? It's almost like, a, a, like um, human hospice care or something like that. You know, there, there's a point at which you have to ask, do you prolong life forever or not? <laughs>
Ed, isn't that one of the issues that the um, ecological sustainability people are really trying to make us, go, in a sense, go back? They want to say all those little towns should be sustainable if people were working hard on their own little farms and um, and they haven't re wrestled with that. I mean, it may be that some of those towns really do need to die. Well, that, I think that, uh, that in some cases that's probably true. And it goes <laughs> back to what I was saying about Powell and the Homestead yeah. Act. I mean, we, those towns exist because of bad public policy to a certain extent. And you can't, uh, uh, and, and Mother Nature is kind of caught up with us. And uh, that's one way to look at it. Now, I, I am all for, for giving the people in all of those towns whatever tools they might have to figure out what are the alternatives to the town disappearing. And in some cases, there will be alternatives. Um, I think it's kind of exciting the way you've mapped paradoxes. Perhaps um, the, another step of what you've done is shown us kind of moderate rescaling our organic communities among those paradoxes in ways that can negotiate them in varying ways. Um, and I wonder, I, I've been working, looking closely at tribal sovereignty patterns, and I wonder if um, yet another model on a lot of layers, including the legal structures around tribal sovereignty in relation to a federal government, perhaps in something other than a wardship and domestic dependent relationship. But certainly there's self-governance in tribal sovereignty, but there's also other layers of um, the energy of the people on the land as a value that drives far beyond the governance, perhaps almost to those mystical levels that you invoke. And, and I wonder if um, drawing on those patterns could be a next step also. Well, I think so. I, I actually think that as particularly Western communities and, uh, and ecosystems and so on begin to rethink sovereignty, that, uh, that the way in which tribes have kept sovereignty on the table uh, becomes a very important part of, uh, of the conversation. Yes. So about four or five years ago here in Missoula, we had a, well, we tried to put through an air quality um, standard that was greater than what the state standard was, and there was a lot of people who didn't want to do that, um, knowing that we have a unique um, inversion layer here with the, the lock and stuff. We have kind of a unique feature because the valley's so tight, and it seemed like so it seems like there, at this point, there, to me, I can't think of examples where we've particularly been allowed to do something different to meet the ecosystem level or the needs of our landforms. Do you have examples? Are you seeing some progress in that? I mean, obviously, eastern and western Montana are another example where they're very different areas and should probably have different regulations based on that. Right. Large and small businesses is another area you look at where they're not the same kinds of entities. Are you seeing examples of that? Are we starting to get any shift that way? Well, it, it, you know, I think some of the good news, if, it, if you just look locally here in, in Missoula, but not only in Missoula, let's just take, uh, take this as an example. Look at everything Missoula has done over the last 20 years to reclaim the riverfront, to build trails and, uh, and parks along the riverfront and, uh, and out into the neighborhoods and so on. Um, that's all been local initiative. Uh, you, you know, there has there has sometimes been state and sometimes federal money that we've tapped into, but uh, but that's very incidental to what has made those things happen. The reason, one of the biggest reasons they've uh, they've happened is because we've had state law like tax increment financing mechanisms that allow communities to do, to do these things. Now, I think what's important about that is here you've got state law that enables communities to do something or not do it as they see fit, as opposed to overarching state law that says you all have to do things exactly this way. 
and, and especially when you get down to zoning and land use and subdivision regulations, I think that's way too, too much mandated at the state level, especially in a state like Montana that has such vastly different experiences. You know, how can you expect anybody in circle to understand uh, the need for growth management? Um, they're, they're, they're not going to. And, and, um, so, so, but you know, we just need a lot more flexibility in the, in those arenas. Well, that was a very positive note. We, oh, okay. But we just before everybody has to uh, to leave, we wanted to thank our distinguished speaker for launching our uh, the Ethics Center uh, talk, Daniel Kimmis, and we're really proud that he uh, joined us today. Thank He'd you. like to give him. Thank you. We might persuade him to stay around and answer some more questions here, uh, and hope to see you next time. And we'll be talking about China. And Terry Widener will be here on, I believe, October 16th. Thank you for coming. <laughs>